then I'll get started. Oh, my presentation is a little long-winded, so I would like to try to start probably in the next couple of minutes. So uh, I noticed real quick on the table there, um, there is a survey, which I didn't know about. It's not about me, it's just about the series in general. If you'd like to take one with you when you leave and fill it out, that would be great. Um, I also passed out on every other seat a handout, which I hope you share with somebody. And I left some extras on the table in case people file them in so they will be able to grab them. So good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I am, as you heard, Sarah Pino Perry. Um, today I'll be talking about uh, Matthew's Gospel with Jesus as healer. Now, I, I'm going to tell you flat out, when I was approached to be a volunteer for this, um, I didn't know that I was going to be responsible to fill in the content. I thought I was just going to be a facilitator. Okay. And then when I found out that I had to fill in the content, you know, I was like, oh my God, I'm so into just intimidated. So um, I slept on it and I decided to take the plunge. So what I'd like to emphasize in this is I am you and you are me. We're really operating at the same level here. And as I journeyed into this, I realized that I had to make a choice. Would I rely on academic studies to prepare for this, or would I take another approach and instead share my experience to inspire you to harvest meaning that would live with you? So that was the differentiator. So we have little time and a lot to explore. I want you to keep an open mind and a sharp mind. I only pick two readings, okay? And they'll be completely familiar to you. Um, and, but I want you to try to make them personal, if you can. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna start uh, with the first reading, and we're gonna take it as a guided meditation, okay? So what I'm gonna ask you to do is to please close your eyes, Relax yourself and get comfortable. Now take a deep, slow breath in. Hold it for a count of just two and slowly release it. Keep your eyes closed. Please imagine yourself in a typical Sunday service here at St. Paul's. I will now read the gospel according to Matthew. This is Jesus heals a man with leprosy. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, can you make me clean? Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as testimony to them. Now continue to keep your eyes closed. Time has stopped. Your mind is free. Reflect on these questions and focus on the ones that spark interest. Do you take this passage at face value? What questions or feelings does it arouse? What would you ask Matthew about this passage? Would you expect anything different from Jesus? Now, open your eyes, catch your breath. Everything I read and the questions are on the handout at the top. Speak whatever thought you have, good, bad, indifferent, interest, or belief, disbelief, even neutrality. There's no judgment. So now I invite you to talk. Well, I, I take it at face value in the beginning. Hearing a story, um, and I've been told through my teaching growing up that miracle. So to take it, that's the, to me the sort of the basic, taking it 
case level. Okay. But of course, I know there's more. <laughs> and anybody else? Any reactions to that simple story? That I'm wondering why Jesus said, see that you don't tell yeah. anyone. What's the reason for the secret? That's great. That's a, That's a good, good thing to key on. Anything else? Yeah. Let's, let's hold that for a moment. That's great. Anything else? Um, the answer to the question, what questions or feelings does it arouse? What touches me is how vulnerable, how this man has to be so vulnerable to yes. ask for healing. And I think that's Excellent. an aspect of the story. I think that's an important thing. So before we jump back to Jim's question, what else? What's hitting me is that he, he claimed, the word claim, mm -hmm. you know, implying that he was dirty. Yes. But it wasn't. Yes. Still. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, please. Um, uh, as far as offer the gift, Moses commanded yes. as a testimony. Yeah. They're related. Okay. All right. So I'll I'll jump in with that. So when I read this, my reaction, I did not know what was meant by the gift Moses commanded, that whole line. See that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest to offer the gift Moses commanded as testimony to that. So I researched academic papers, and the answer was far longer than I was hoping for. <laughs> it called for the book of Leviticus, Hebrews, John, Psalms, Isaiah, and Ephesians. Good Lord, that was my reaction. <laughs> so the, the actual gift, its description and symbolism come from the Hebrew Bible. It involves all the usual incantations that in our modern context uh, takes further study to appreciate. Things like birds, strange plants, purging with blood, holy water, etc. Too much to go into here. I'll leave it to the scholars. The detail of the ritual was not what was important to me. It's the symbolism that Jesus portrayed in the context of a time when religion was everything. It was faith, law, social standards, and community. Anything that deviated was ostracized, and the priests had authority to call judgment and forgiveness. By enacting the gift that Moses prescribed, priests had the power to forgive sins and declare one healed. So talk about power and authority. So now I want you to just close your eyes for a second. We're going to a, a, a soft guided meditation. I want you to transport yourself back to the time of Matthew, Jesus, and the leper. Here's what you're faced with. Leprosy is a picture of sin. It defiles, spreads, and destroys a person. The gift that was given to the priest is used for judgment of sin and cleansing of the leper. Physical ailments at the time were considered a sign of sinfulness even God's retaliation for wrongdoing, and an open testament to the public for one's transgressions. Now open your eyes. If, if, as the leper, how does this make you feel? Less than. Uh, yeah. An outcast. An outcast. Yeah, it's, it's pretty severe. Um, so like you, I personalize this and I ask myself, who has the power to judge my direct association to God? Is it faith by prescription as commanded by a priest? And how does that heal me? <laughs> Jesus, in my opinion, was sticking it to the man. Okay? <laughs> but without ego, Without ego, because he told the leper, as Jim pointed out, don't tell anyone, just the priest. This was far more important than all the academic studies I came across. It told me that my direct relationship to God, with Jesus as the symbolic conduit, is all that now. Um, so I would like to take you on another journey. I would like for you to pretend that you are the person being healed in the next story. I want you to get 
comfortable again. <clears throat> Close your eyes. Breathe in slowly and deeply. Hold for two. And exhale slowly. With your eyes closed, let's imagine ourselves in the center of the following reading. Translate the details of this reading into visual images, no matter how minor the detail. This account has a woman and a girl who are being healed. It does not matter which, you imagine, which one you imagine to be. You could be both if you like, but put yourself in at least one of their shoes. So this is Jesus raises a girl, a dead girl, and heals a sick woman. Here we go. A synagogue leader came and knelt before him <clears throat> and said, My daughter has just died, but come put your hand on her, and she will live. Jesus got up, went with him, and so did his disciples. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, came up behind them and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Then Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. News of this spread throughout all the region. Now with eyes still closed and the images fresh in your mind, consider these questions. What simple gesture by Jesus and the woman were mentioned several times in this reading? Was there anything Jesus said that seems odd? What does the synagogue leader mean to you, if anything? Now open your eyes and catch your breath. And let's talk. And the handouts have both my questions and the gospel. So you can refer to it. I think that the first thing that stood out for me is um, uh, take care of daughter. I would think more sister, but more of a father. Yes, a fatherly figure. Right. right. Well, what do you call her daughter? It's obviously not a biological connection. No, right? but, okay. right. Just that, yeah, absolutely. The, the, the touching. The touching. He put his hand on, on, on her. There was a lot of mention of touching. Yeah, and mm -hmm. lots of touching. And obviously, your faith will heal you. And your faith will heal you. Thanks for your insights. When I first read this, I had some ideas until I looked into more scholarly studies. And these studies filled in some vital details that I'll mention here in brief. Okay? So this passage establishes Jesus' authority over death. Picks up the girl and she's alive. Yeah? Scholars make comparison to Luke and Mark's Gospels around the same passage. 
I would strongly recommend that on your own time that you go read it. You have the handout and compare the two. Matthew's version for sure is the cliff note version of the story, hands down. That was just the start. Scholars talk about the significance of the synagogue leader coming to Jesus, the connection to overcoming worldly death through salvation, quotes from Kings, Acts, Revelations, and self-references to other synoptic gospels. He got kind of really involved. Even Isa came into play. Does anybody know who Isa is? That's spelled I S A. Separate clergy. Does anybody know? Who is? <laughs> I think um, in Islam or in Tibet too, they refer to as Saint Isa. Yes. So in the, in, in the Quran, yeah. Isa is what Jesus is referred to. But in in that text. Jesus is not how Christians interpret Jesus. He's an important prophet. Okay, so that that's so all this huge mix of things and all these papers started. And so I was glad to be exposed to all this information, and I strongly encourage that you make some attempt to appreciate the scholarly analysis. But I came to appreciate that Matthew's reductionist style and emphasis on the core business at hand was actually timeless for me. It became, I became acutely aware that getting overly invested in studies runs a risk that I'll explain shortly. Now, here's where I get dangerous. I now tread the dangerous path where liberties of the amateur non-scholar flourishes into wild conjecture. <laughs> so I beg that you don't take this as an imposition, but simply as a spark that invites you to find your own center of thought. Here's my personal reaction and commentary and some sermonizing thrown in. It is Sunday after all. <laughs> so, by way of my wife Audrey, who had no knowledge of my machinations around this presentation, I went through four drafts. Is <laughs> a quote she read to me that I will share to you. Do not confuse understanding with a larger vocabulary. Sacred writings are beneficial in stimulating desire for inner realization if one stanza at a time is slowly assimilated. Otherwise, continual intellectual study may result in vanity, false satisfaction, and undigested knowledge. That's a quote from a Swami by the name of Sri Yukteswar. Um, so it was synchronicity at that point because I was just flipping around and all this stuff was buzzing in my head. I did not want my intellect to distance me from the emotional intelligence in my heart. It becomes passive. So I was told once that if you're not struggling with faith, then you're not thinking about it. From the few passages we covered, it appears that the saved made it look simple. They had faith, they believed in Jesus, he cured them, and they were cleansed. So I beg to differ. <laughs> Prior to Jesus, these people were publicly and guilty, the sinful, the pun and the punished by God. Talk about struggling with faith. Imagine living as an outcast through no fault of your own, victim of circumstance or disease, and expected to give praise according to prescribed faith. Talk about a struggle. Uh, faith under those conditions can't be easy. So I asked myself, 
Why these accounts of Jesus' healings illustrates blind faith entrusted so freely. Jesus, to me, is symbolic of that intuitive inner voice that does not prescribe, but rather demonstrates through simple, kind gestures the kind of faith that breaks through the barriers of pious religiosity. If you need help, and someone simply extends their hand with sympathy and sympathetic eyes, does this not reach deeper than formal ritual and directives? Does it not invite ins the instinctive connection we harbor between us to be shared with one another? If not permanently, are we at least are or we not at least temporarily lifted in this transaction of trust and faith? That elusive but trusting faith can only happen when we willingly share our humanity with each other. Our modern lives are not steeped in the times of the Hebrew or Christian Bibles, but the message and influences of God. What have we substituted? for prescribed laws and practices from the past. What has influenced our thinking, our sense of community, acceptance of others in our modern world? Has the politics of our current era filled that void? And what about our worries around our economic state? or even the well-being of our physical health in this pandemic world. We have a lot of parallels here now. Is Jesus' healing relegated only to the physical? Or is it meant to underscore the power of humanity to heal beyond the physical? Where does the intersection of miracle apply to the physical? balance out against the value of humanity applied to healing of soul, society, and nurturing of goodwill. The subject of faith is complex as it applies to the miracles of Jesus' healing. Should they be taken at face value? Is Jesus only a miracle worker? Or is this all hyperbole of events that may have had simpler roots, but over time grown into grand lore? I'm not suggesting we tackle that here, but I will offer the following. <clears throat> the physical acts and healing miracles were not what interests me, but the connections behind what makes it whole Healing to me <clears throat> is the product of ingredients that are overlapping and inseparable. In every gospel account, the humanity demonstrated by Jesus was done against the prevailing views of the time. But to demonstrate humanity, you must know how to love. Without love, there can be no humanity. Faith is the courage that drives the action of love with humanity. I concluded that this inseparable trio, love, humanity, and faith, yields the product of healing. For me, Jesus is symbolic of that perfection. And that is what I came through with this exercise. <laughs> so, what does this mean for you? What does this mean for you? I had more time to think about this, but let it gel. I know I threw a lot at While you're digesting that, um, on the back of the handout, you know, I, I included the quote from the Swami, and I also included a bunch of questions that are sort of reminiscent of the ones that raised here. 
and some additional ones for you to sort of dwell on? Uh, I think the questions are um, very thought-provoking. I mean, I know you quite well. I'm <laughs> 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 not you, but to hear, you know, I wasn't really privy to what he was going to say exactly, but um, it, it seems like the questions are really timely, as if your spine is kind of soaking up what's, what's all around us, and the, maybe the lack of love in humanity, in humanity and faith, you know, and how important it really is, just that trio. Hmm. And, and being more heartfelt and less into, intellectualizing, like from the Swami quote. <laughs> Throw another curveball at you. If I not, I've got a few minutes. <laughs> um, the idea of forgiveness kind of came into my head, but that probably means I would have written another page and a half and got forbid that or <laughs> that one too. Um, how does forgiveness fit into that trio? Well, you you forgive from from. Place of love. Yeah. Usually, yeah. you you can't um, you can't forgive if you're not in a place of love. You know, um, and if, if you're angry or, or you're still holding on to something, um, it doesn't allow you to to be open to to receive anything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that that's where that comes from. Um, it, in terms of faith and healing. Um, you know, you in a way, um, you ask the question uh, about whether the, the, the physical healing is more important or the soulful healing is more important. I think they're interconnected because I think as one, as, as the body is healed, the mind is healed. You know, uh, it's very rare that you, you, your, your body is healed and there's nothing going on upstairs. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of healing has to do, if you think of people who have chronic illnesses, yeah. you know, a lot of, of their faith comes from uh, living through the illness, yes. you know, um, so that, that's how I, I would respond to that question. Thank you, that was good input. Yes? I just want to thank you because drawing attention to the interconnectedness of uh, faith and love and humanity is, I think, really resonates, I think, for me with, with what Jesus was about. And, and for me, it raises the question that we might want to consider is what was Jesus actually healing these people from? Mm -hmm. Thanks, and that goes back to some of the earlier comments, mm -hmm. healing from rejection of society. Mm -hmm. All these practical human considerations, right? Besides the law, so yes. Um, I'd like to interject fear, and where does mm. fear yes. take place yes. in response to what you were saying? And I know that for me personally, um, if I let fear overcome me of projecting in the future or whatever, I lose my faith, but if I just stop and let myself feel love and faith, then those miracles happen for me. And I open myself to healing through other people and connecting with other people. I'm thinking back on a very difficult time in my life seven years ago. My friend Nancy came to mind. And I was at a point where I was having terrible PTSD and I was living alone and I was so scared and just I didn't even want to walk down the street to the mailbox mm -hmm. just a mess. and my friend Nancy came to my house I didn't even know her that well and she sat out with me it must have been for like four or five hours mm -hmm. and we connected there's a woman I didn't even know and I felt hope again her just sitting with me and connecting with me and showing me love and understanding. So that to me is, is faith and love that's so important. And the fear when 
fear gets interjected. And we can look at this on a global scale with the world. It just creates anger and self-righteousness and just all that, all that negativity that messes us all up. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Yeah. Re-emphasize what's just been said. It's not my thinking. There has to be engagement. You you have to take the risk to engage in in order to uh, uh, to benefit to you. Yeah, I find in my own, my own experience, you don't benefit from any of this unless you're engaged. That that you. It's, it's not something you, that you do on your own. You, you get it uh, from being engaged and involved with other people and then things happen that, you, that you, you're, not, uh, you're not planning on, but uh, uh, they tend to uh, give you strength, as this woman said, uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not, a lonely self thing. You must you must be engaged. I agree. Yes. And, and, and literally, uh, writing on just what you were saying, another word that came to me was willingness. It's the willing to be willing. When you're willing to be willing, you 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 have to put your ego aside, and you have to be willing to look up to tie your sneakers, and you know maybe there's going to be support. Yeah, Jesus repeatedly said about his healing, when you read the gospel about healing, don't make this a big public thing, but go home see this person. So the ego is never really about go sound the drum of what I did kind of thing. You're right. You're right. Yes. You said really resonating with that, willing to be willing. That is a better definition for faith than look how much I believe. Um, yeah. You know, it's and I actually uh, I, is it the in Philippians the jailer says, "I believe, Lord." Or is that I believe, Lord, help my unbelief? Yes. Or, or, you know, is it, um, that sense of like it, it is and it isn't. So I'm willing to be willing. Yeah. That makes more sense to me. Well, the, the same Swami said, "Look fear in the face, and it will no longer disturb you." Mm. Yeah. Question: What kind of healing do you need? And don't be afraid to ask for it. Yeah, I don't back think we yeah. ever think of what kind of healing we personally need. Yeah. It's not oh. just about participating in healing in others. Sometimes we need it. It's it's all the way around. Mm -hmm. The same thing with forgiveness. We tend to think of us being the the person doing the forgiving to someone else, but we could be on the other side. Mm -hmm. right? Self forgiveness. And, and how does it affect you if you're the one being forgiven? You know? Well, you always say that forgiving is not for you. It's not for the other person, it's for you. Mm -hmm. exactly. Because you're the one. It's like, you know, it's, you can take poison and expect someone else to die. But <laughs> you're, it's, it's really for you because they're probably going on with their life. They don't get it. It's a great matter, Carol. Mm -hmm. um, but you're holding it. So it's, right. you know, and it's part of it. And I, you know, I'm kind of thinking a little bit opposite of what you else said. I believe that if you forgive your soul, forgive yourself or you know the, the healing starts with you and then it manifests physically because like disease is dis is just like you know yes. because that's why i'm always conscious of trying not to be um, filled with anxiety and fear because it will i think it will manifest as a disease mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah. you know i kind of think if you fix this and then the physical mm -hmm. will be fixed I'd say, oh, I would just say one other thing as I always think about, and this is really stimulating by what you were saying, sir. I always think of Jesus as said of looking at two things at the same time. He's looking at each person, he's loving them completely, and he's looking at the 
creation of beloved community. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, how can my interaction with this one person, yeah. right, yeah. promote? Yeah. And so yeah. when I think of healing, it's just what you were saying. The physical healing may happen like that, but the incredible burden and residue of being a social outcast takes a long time to heal. Where does that happen? In the beloved community. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, he's, he's, everything he does is symbolic of creating a beloved community. And, and the healing that we feel in that beloved community makes us also feel, as you said so beautifully, powerful enough, enough agency to forgive, to forgive ourselves, to forgive others, to actually, instead of being angry or hateful over how we've been treated, to actually have compassion for those people. So, for, I don't think Jesus ever took his eye off of that duality. Yeah, and that's the problem with trying to be like an individual prayer. <laughs> Okay, I go to the other club service and I pray to God and I go home. Because <laughs> it, it, Jesus never took his eye on the community and, and his capacity to heal. Does, does that make sense? Yes, yes. it does. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Absolutely. I'm being ignored. <laughs> so, I'd like to bring up the point of how does one know one has been healed? Mm. Good question. Great question. So, just in the past couple of months alone, So I was thinking of the, the sermon that Daniel gave, I think, two weeks ago about what if generosity is the, like, the, the starting place. Like That's the, the place that we're naturally at, is being generous, and that it's things in this life that separate us from our generosity. And I wonder, to what extent, togetherness is inherent. Uh, what if that is, is the kind of base, natural state, and that our illness and sickness is this, this, uh, or this fear that separates us from community. What's happening in each of these scriptures is these people are alone and separated from their community, and God opens their eyes to go back with your people. You were always with them, but like, let you see that you were with them the whole time. Uh, and that that's our, our faith. And that we, choosing or not, are the ones that separate ourselves and become lonely and it's, it's a weird, like, I, I certainly have a tendency to, like, take everything on myself and not share my burdens with others and, and 
separate myself and then I feel different and alone and hurt and painful and I don't know, it's really hard sometimes to change that perspective and think, oh no, like we're all in this together. Like that's that's the, the natural state and that I through fear and and separating myself from God. Really love. You just have to go all in. Yeah. Into yeah. the community. Yeah. Yeah. The dance into is about reflecting on what we've done so that uh, what comes next is in the zone. And I'll add to this, I'm kind of speaking on their behalf and what they asked me to say, um, the, one of the best things about this is that it's been lay leadership. You know, it's phenomenal. And uh, so that means for the next thing, we would need people to say, yeah, I'll, I'll do a session. Um, what they're looking toward is something in Advent. They, they is we. They said we need to take a step back. We've got other stuff going on. But saying, can we organize something for Advent? So, um, actually, I'm, this is. I'm not going to look. I'm not going to count who said this. But anybody would be willing to say, yeah, I'll, I would do something. It's just me straw polling it. I know this is not for the. And that's enough right there. Can I make a plug of saying, and I, I will speak for myself, but maybe the other presenters as well, the process of getting up and like working through these materials is mm. really, like you learn so much more through like preparing and getting ready for these, that it's a gift. Mm. Like you think like, oh, like I have to prepare, but it's, it's really enriching to get to dive into it and know what it's. No, yeah. and you can see that you can prepare ten, prepare ten minutes of content, but it involves group work. You can wind us up and turn us loose. Uh, <laughs> so it, it, it can be discreet, and uh, so so meditate on that. If you are willing to do a session, then we'll come back and ask again and, and start lining something up for Advent. Um, but I want you to all take one of these, fill it out, bring it back. Just a quick announcement. Yes. Um, also, if you are interested in continuing um, diving into scripture and engaging with one another, this Thursday we will be starting um, just a Bible study on Zoom, um, so you can hop on from wherever you are. It will be at 11 a.m. Um, the Zoom link is in the Wednesday Weekly, but if you didn't get that for some reason, just come find me, um, and it should be a good time. So, hope to see you there. Is that on the women? Yeah, we're going to be doing women, saints, and scripture starting on Thursday at 11. Mary, the classic. Yeah, mm -hmm. Thursday at 11. That's great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Th